evening. Good evening to the audience members who've joined us in person, and good evening to the folks who have joined us via Zoom. We're very glad that you're attending the League of Women Voters Santa Fe County Candidate Forum. This forum is for the two candidates for the United States House of Representatives, District 3. I'm Irene Epp, and I'm the moderator for the forum this evening. And before we do anything else, I want to say how proud and pleased I am to have two women candidates running for office. I am there. You're both making me very happy. And now, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I would like to express our gratitude especially to the Santa Fe, am I still on? Yeah. The Santa Fe New Mexican for broadcasting our City of Santa Fe candidate forums this year and also in the past. The New Mexican does this as a service to our community. It's a no strings attached support that over the years has allowed the League to provide nonpartisan, authoritative election information to thousands of folks in Santa Fe County publishing the voter guide and now by live streaming our candidate forums so everybody can attend. I'm also, as I said before, honored again to introduce the candidates for the United States House of Representatives in District 3. Starting on the far side for me is Alexis Martinez Johnson, and I'm proud to be able to moderate the forum with you, and also Teresa Ledger Fernandez. I am proud to be here with both of you ladies here. I'm lucky. The candidates have, of course, agreed to follow the league protocols for candidate forums this evening. And that includes respecting time limits for their responses. It also is expected that we'll be practicing civil conversation. But honestly, I have no doubt about that. I've had a look at these two women, and I'm sure that you're going to have an informative and very professional forum. We'll begin with two-minute opening statements from the candidates, and then we'll be asking them a series of questions. All of the questions have been submitted by the audience, both the audience here in person and also the audience in Zoom. The remote audience can send an email, which will be immediately delivered, and those of you who are sitting here should all have, within easy reach, an index card or something to write on. If you don't, you can raise your hand. We have two League of Women Voters members in the back of the room who will supply you with an index card so that you can make a question. They'll run it up to the table in front. And they will pose the question, look at it, and the candidates can answer it. The candidates will be answering your questions in a rotating order. And that rotating order will vary a little bit, so it's very balanced and they will answer as many questions as we have time for. This forum ends at 7-ish, and at that, before that time, we'll conclude with two-minute closing statements from each candidate in a reverse order from their opening statements. If you haven't already submitted your questions, I've explained. Email those of you who are Zooming and can still hear this, and on the index cards for those of you who are present. This is a very long introduction. Um, let's see. Da da da. We've covered that. We've covered up. Um, okay. The questions that you are actually asked this evening, especially for the two candidates, are going to be questions that have been selected. Sometimes there are questions that are duplicated, and therefore they'll sort of combine those and make them into one question. If somebody has some inappropriate comment to make. We will not waste your time with that. You won't have any questions like that. I will, however, be giving the candidates a time limit of two minutes or less for your answers. And by your seat at the table, you've agreed to that. And I'm a very kind lady, but I will interrupt you if you're going over the two minute limit. But you don't have to worry. There's a nice lady in a maroon turtleneck. She is the power, actually, of this event. <laughs> Hold up that yellow one, Mary Shrubin. That says 30 seconds left. It means you should be winding up. If she holds up the red one, the three of us are in trouble, because then I might have to say, please, 
conclude your remarks with about one word. We are now ready to go. We're going to begin with two minute opening statements by each candidate. Okay, ready to go? All right, in the beginning, we're going to start with an opening statement by candidate Ledger Fernandez. Two minutes. So first, I really want to thank the League of Women Voters, not just for this forum tonight, but what, for what they have done to make sure that voters are informed and participating in democracy for decades and years and generations. So thank you very much for that. I am Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, a daughter of rural New Mexico. I was born into our spirit of community and raised to protect what we love. I went to Head Start in West Las Vegas and then was trained as a rebellious lawyer at Stanford Law. And what's the most rebellious thing we can do? Listen. I have been listening and delivering to my communities here in New Mexico for 30 years, delivering health clinics, small businesses, Head Start schools, clean water. And now as your Congresswoman, I'm still listening and delivering. When the Forest Service started the largest wildfire in our history, I held them accountable and got $2.5 billion to pay for what was lost. When the VA wanted to close four health clinics in our rural areas, I helped keep them open. But we must also invest in the infrastructure that our communities need to thrive. So, we are bringing home millions of dollars so that we can expand broadband across New Mexico. I am funding water projects across my district from Navajo to the Eastern Water Project in Portales and Clovis. I'm the mother of three beautiful children, a breast cancer survivor, a sister who lost two brothers to addiction. My work is inspired by the pain New Mexicans face but also by the opportunities we can create so that we can all thrive. You know, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that God's plan is for us to prosper, have hope, and a future. My job in Congress is to help create that prosperity, hope, and a future. So if you re-elect me to Congress, I pledge that I will continue to listen and deliver with a big heart and with deep understanding. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Now it is candidate Johnson, Mar Martinez Johnson. Muchas gracias. I just want to say thank you to everyone here and the League of Women Voters. It has been quite some time in the history of the United States where you know, women actually had a voice or the opportunity to vote. So for me to see other women supporting women of various parties, I think is amazing. You know, I think that's the best thing that we can do is to support women and for little girls and little boys to see, hey, that's mom up there, that's auntie, that's grandma, and to know that they can be a voice in the community. And so I wanna thank the League of Women Voters and everyone for their time and being here, and also people from other countries. I see that there's uh, some people from England, and I mentioned as they came in, thank you for participating in this American experiment, because that's truly what it is. And as a little girl growing up on the south side of Roswell, which is now in this district, you know, I was always told that you know, there's not anything that you can't be. And the reason that I'm running is because I wanna make sure that my four children have that opportunity so that you know a zip code is not determining the future and quite frankly in new mexico today that is the case and i want to make sure that those barriers are broken i came from a family where i was raised by my grandparents and statistically you know i shouldn't have come out to where i came but education was key i attended vanderbilt university on an academic scholarship and after that i received an environmental engineering degree here at New Mexico Tech. I then worked in the environmental engineering industry, making sure that New Mexicans had jobs, and we solved very complex problems with various stakeholders, and we came to the table, and we agreed that we were gonna make this work for jobs to keep the lights on and to do it in the most environmentally respectful manner. 
So I'm here to bring my expertise and forte to bring uh, prosperity to New Mexico and opportunity for our children and all children here in New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much, candidates, for most excellent opening statements. And I'm just waiting for the first exciting questions. <laughs> All right, this is question number one. And I am going to go back and start with you, candidate Ledger Fernandez. And the question is, what, what you, it says, what you said are are given your top priorities. Pick one of your top priorities and explain what you really propose to do about it. So given your top priorities, pick one and explain what you propose to do about it. So this is always a difficult thing to limit our priorities to only one. So we will wait a few minutes while we wait for No, those no, didn't. we talked about it. Okay, my, my top priorities are making sure that we all have the voice that we need. It is. Hello. Okay, here we go. Now it's there. Okay, thank you so very much. So, you know, the issue about trying to pick a single priority is that our lives in our communities are complex, right? We know that we must address a range of issues in New Mexico. Uh, one of the things that I have focused on is making sure that we bring money down into New Mexico that we have appropriated this year. This year we've done, the last two years, we've done an amazing job of looking at what are the issues that we have in New Mexico that need solving. So we passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. We passed the Chips and Science Act. As I mentioned earlier, we got that $2.5 billion to help pay for what was lost in Hermit's Peak. So these are all really wonderful, wonderful uh, investments in our communities and in our future, but if we do not bring that money down into New Mexico, we will not see the benefits of them. So one of my priorities, my top priorities, is making sure that we get that clean water into New Mexico. So while we've given $100 million to broadband, there is $47 billion that's available that we need to compete for. So I am working to give my small communities, to give the nonprofits the the tools that they need to be able to apply for and get that money the same things with housing right nowhere do I go in, in the in my district without people talking to me about the need for affordable housing so I am making sure that I am bringing funds and programs to New Mexico to provide for affordable housing whether that be workforce housing for um, health professionals in Cuba, or helping with down payment assistance through HomeWise. And we know that that's when people need their assistance, is at the time they're buying their home, and that's one of the things I'm working on. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. We need to be concerned with safety. And what do I mean by safety? That's going to be your current and future economic security. In addition to that, we need to be safe in our own person, in our homes, with our families. As we go out here on the streets of Santa Fe, uh, there's crime. New Mexico is the second highest rated for violent crime. And I think each and every person has been affected either themselves personally or know someone that has a crime committed against them. So if we are not safe in our economy, in our own person, and in our health, then what do we have? So when you look at me, I'm going to be a candidate as an engineer that I'm going to start with the priority list. We cannot absolutely go out and spend trillions and trillions of dollars and send trillions and trillions of dollars to other countries when New Mexican children go hungry. We have to have a robust house to take care of ourselves so that we can help others. Yes, we need to have international security, but we also need to meet, meet, uh, meet the aim of being domestically strong. And we differ, my opponent and I, 
on a key issue, and that is energy. Energy in New Mexico needs to be bipartisan. We need to keep the lights on, and we need to be warm. But quite frankly, you're going to be paying $953 in electric bills. And then you used to be paying almost half of that last year. We haven't seen this inflationary cost since when I was born in November of 1981. These are serious times where inflation is at its highest. And we need to make sure that we select individuals that are going to be concerned with that bottom line of creating safety in Santa Fe, in New Mexico, and throughout the entire United States. So I'm going to be someone that's going to work through party lines, and I'm going to answer to the people of New Mexico. Because as an elected representative, it can't be that the person with the most money and the most special interest has the voice in the United States. We have to return that voice to the people and putting food on the table, a roof over their head, being safe in our environment. Oh, thank you. I decided not to mind. Thank you. Okay, next question, Alexis, is going to begin with you. And here it is. Drug and alcohol abuse have long been a problem in New Mexico. And now there is fentanyl abuse that has made it worse. What can be done to address this epidemic? Well, I think that securing the border is key. You know, it is not compassionate, and it is, quite frankly, not safe to have fentanyl streaming across the border, and it is the number one killer from 18 to 45-year-olds in the United States. And we did hear the Vice President Kamala Harris say, the border's secure. We had 50 plus individuals die in a diesel, and some of those were minors. We have to have a bipartisan solution to making sure that we have technology that is checking those ports of entry, that we make sure that there's areas that are open are not conduits for trafficking. You know, when we traffic children in New Mexico, when we have drugs, and you say that the border is secure, I don't care what party you're from, we can do better. We can do better what's going on. And first, we have to acknowledge that there is a problem. And that's a priority. It contributes to crime. And if we don't have anybody looking at that border and really investing, crime is going to continue. And here in Santa Fe and other parts of New Mexico, we're going to see the scourge of what substance abuse does to families. We need to make sure that we're funding mental health centers Chemical dependence is really needed. We need centers for that. And I would look to fully fund those areas and make sure that we have appropriate uh, personnel. You know, it is a complex problem. Okay. Not we're, only do we have to stop supply, to but close. also demand. Candidate Ledger Fernandez. Thank you. This is indeed a heartbreaking question because it's, is an issue that too many New Mexicans live. I lost two brothers to addiction. So many of our New Mexican families face the pain that my family has, and that pain will never go away. But what I can do is acknowledge that there is much that can be done. And so I have focused a lot of my work in Congress on addressing addiction, addressing um, the need for mental health services. One of the bills that I have sponsored would be uh, to interdict and prevent and intervene with actual programs that have shown to have as a result in college. And so we, in, in developing that bill, I made sure I went around to the different colleges and got input from the students as, what do we need? What will work here? Because we know that a lot of addiction starts in college. We need to treat addiction as a health care issue, and we have failed to do that for way too long. We have criminalized it when indeed those who are suffering need health care and we need to provide that to them. Uh, we also do need to interdict and, and 
and prevent the flow of drugs into our communities. And I am heartened by the collaboration that we have seen lately. We have been putting a lot more money into that since we got in office uh, two, 22 months ago. And you're starting to see it. You're starting to see those very large drug busts. There is now collaboration that is happening between the FBI, between federal agencies, and between state and local agencies. And 30 that's seconds what, left. And that's exactly what needs to happen, where you have that collaboration so that we can stop the drugs from coming in. But let's never forget the need to treat with compassion and deep love those who suffer from addiction. Thank you. Thank you both. The next question, we will begin with candidate Ledger Fernandez. We're going to keep bouncing back and forth between you. What are your positions regarding Social Security? So thank you very much for that question, because we know Social Security needs strengthening. Too many seniors in New Mexico rely solely on Social Security, so we must not let them down. I held a town hall, a tele-town hall, that was thousands participated because I wanted to go over the Social Security Act of 2100 that I am a co-sponsor of and that I am fighting for in Congress. I wanted to make sure we got input from the seniors, from people who weren't seniors, right? We have paid into Social Security and people who rely on it need to be able to know that it's gonna be there for them. So what the Social Security Act of 2100 does is it strengthens it so we'll have solvency. It makes sure that everybody pays because not everybody pays into Social Security. So the wealthy do not pay their fair share. And I will say that sadly, uh, there are the, the the op on the opposite side of the aisle, they don't like our Social Security 2100 plan. Instead, they have a plan. The Republicans have a plan that would change Social Security as we now know it. It would change it so it would have to be approved annually. Can you imagine that? A senior not knowing whether they're gonna get their check in October or November because Congress hasn't acted to pass it. That is their plan. It would destroy Social Security. And I will say that my opponent is actually receiving funds from those who propose that plan. My plan and what I am proposing and supporting with my colleagues is to strengthen Social Security so it is there for those who need it and who rely upon it. Okay, candidate. So, you know, we're not gonna be defunding Social Security. I mean, that's ridiculous. What we do need to have is proper economic know-how, and my expertise and background is in engineering. We base a lot on boundaries and economics, but we cannot increase spending, increase spending to the point that we have such an extreme deficit that it is so astronomical how are we going to have solvency with so much spending going on? So I don't have a problem with checks and balances. I think that we need checks and balances. So no, I would never be taking money out of Social Security. It needs to be there for my grandmother, my aunt, you all, your families. So to indicate in any manner that we would be creating a situation that would make Social Security not solvent is simply not true. I mean, that's the whole purpose of wanting to represent everyone here, is to making, make our lives secure, to make it safe. And that cannot be done without checks and balances. So I'm an individual that would be working bipartisan, and I would make sure that there were checks and balances on whoever is in the administration. You know, as the legislative portion and as the executive, whoever goes into office and whatever party's in office. I'm here to represent New Mexicans, and I would fully fund Social Security so that it will be there as the baby boomers age in. We want to make sure that they have that, and the younger people, you know. So um, I would be fully supporting Social Security, and I do support checks and balances. There's nothing wrong with having checks and balances. Okay, thank you. And I just want to remind that actually, it's watching the yellow and the red that remind you of the time limit. Congrats on that. You're doing a really good job. The other thing I would like to say is that there is no need to rebut. We are very interested in the positions that each of you takes as an excellent candidate 
for this position in the U.S. House of Representatives. Okay, so we're especially interested in what you think. And given that, for candidate Martinez Johnson, here is a question about the drought. Given the historic drought New Mexico is experiencing, what strategies would you support to protect our water rights and our resources? Well, we've just seen all the beautiful rain just re recently, and that's been great. So here we've had probably one of the top 10 monsoons with all of this rain in, in our history. And drought is something ever present here in the Southwest in our arid and semi-arid situations. As an environmental en engineer, the crux of what I do was to make sure that we had water systems and, those, and that availability, and that the water was clean and available. I do think that we need professionals like myself that are put in positions to make sure that we are secure. You know, we have to work with other states, such as Colorado, we have to work with Texas, and we need to make sure that we assess those collaborative communication so that we have water going forward. It's gonna be an ebb and flow, as we know, but conservation is key, and proper uh, agricultural use and minimizing our water usage is key. You know, I'd also like to explore, you know, desalinization in this area. I think that is key. That would be something that we can look into that would be innovative and deliver water here for generations. So, you know, that's my background. And I look forward to being your elected congresswoman and delivering results for New Mexico so we have a future here for our children. We all know in New Mexico that Agua es Vida water is life. I am a former Acequia commissioner who knew the value of making sure that the water flowed so that New Mexico could grow. I, as a daughter of rural New Mexico and somebody who actually built water and wastewater systems even before I got to Congress, the issue of preserving and conserving and making sure every drop of water is put to good use is very important to me. But this drought is also a result of the climate crisis. And we see throughout New Mexico that farmers are not receiving the waters they need to be able to irrigate their fields. And if you drive, which I often do, to the eastern part of my district, the monsoons did not hit uh, the eastern part of my district. We saw dust where there should have been pasture. So what I have done is make sure that we invest in water systems throughout New Mexico. I've pointed out the hundreds of millions of water, that, of water projects that I've helped fund from making sure we got water to Gallup, right? Because Navajo, Gallup, Navajo, Navajo should have running water in their homes. Um, to making sure that in the Inflation Reduction Act, something we don't talk about a lot, but I talk about a whole bunch, is the money that we put in the Inflation Reduction Act so that ranchers could get help with the drought. There is significant money there. We've also placed significant money in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Fund so that we could increase the amount of funds so that we can conserve every drop of water because indeed, without water, no IV though, without water there is not life and we want the water to flow so New Mexico can thrive. All right, thank you both very much. And our next question, which will begin with, you began the last time, right? They distracted me with those cards. Did you start last time? Uh, no, uh, Alexis started. Okay, so I am correct. I didn't want to make a mistake. So this is a related question and it is, what regulations of the Forest Service do you think would prevent the accumulation of fuels that cause New Mexico's terrible fires? So this is uh, something that goes um, deep to my soul um, because that was a hor horrible fire that New Mexico, the Forest Service started not one but two fires. And they did it by ignoring their own policies. They did it when they ignored the fuel that was on the ground and how dry it was. So we know that in order to avoid these catastrophic fires, we need to manage the forest better. Uh, prescribed burns, I have called for a national investigation, an independent investigation into the use of prescribed burns. Prescribed burns can be useful, 
but not when you do them recklessly in the windiest part of the year and when the fuel is that dry. We have put significant funds in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. We put funds in there so that we could work on our forests collaboratively, so we could invite tribal indigenous knowledge to come and show us how they use burning in the forest, so that we could make sure we had community input and collaboration in working the forest, so that the Forest Service would also be working with their neighboring tribes. They'd be working with the neighboring private owners to try to bring down the fuel that is in that forest. and only only use prescribed burns when it is safe to do that. Only use prescribed burns when you are not going to be putting communities like mine at risk and committing the egregious harm that they did. I called for that independent investigation. There is going to be an independent investigation, and then we will use the resources that we have allocated wisely to protect our forests and bring back our healthy forests. That is essential. Candidate Martinez Johnson. Two years ago, there were individuals who told the people in Mora, Rociada, Las Vegas, that they could not cut the trees down. These are supporters of my opponent. These individuals would not allow us to cut and have proper timber management. We couldn't cut the wood to heat food. And out there in the rural lifestyle, that's what you do and they shut the timber industry for the spotted owl. Now, as an environmental engineer, it is absolutely imperative we have biological diversity. That's a fact. There is no habitat now for a spotted owl or families. So what you're seeing here is extremism, non-collaboration resulting in something that has occurred before, 10 years ago. We had a prescribed burn by the federal government. I am not a part of the federal government. My opponent is. So to create a crisis and come in as, as a savior is not good for New Mexico. I would have had, when I stepped into office, a monthly meeting with stakeholders, engineers, the community members, tribal members, local, state, federal. And we have a t an issue right now and get together and say, what are the best practices? We should have never been stopped from cutting our wood down. Why? Extreme environmental alarmism. Now, there, that is a big difference between my opponent and I. I look at the worst case scenario as an engineer, and I plan for that. And that would have never happened. In the federal government, do you think that we would start a prescribed burn in the highest velocity wind month of the entire year, and then to blame the institution you're a part of? It's we're over. astounding. We're over. We're over. Thank you. And I would just, a very gentlest of reminders, we're very interested in your view, but there's no reason to beg the question by talking back and forth about opponents, OK? Just if you'll share your view, thank you. And our next question goes back to candidate Ledger Fernandez. This has to do, again, it's a bit related. It has to do, what's the other way? Okay, it's for you, pardon me. It's for candidate Martinez Johnson. Thank what you. national energy policies would you support if you were in Congress? I would support the energy policies that keeps our light on, keeps us warm, and, you know, we all know that the temperatures rise. That's a scientific fact. When you tell people that the world is going to end in 12 years, and every 12 minutes people are dying in Ukraine, when New Mexico could be supplying energy to Louisiana and Texas and helping out in Europe. Those are the type of solutions that I bring. There is a very real consequence when this administration goes to Venezuela, when they go to Saudi Arabia. You're talking about a current administration 
that works with absolute despots. Saudi Arabia killed an American journalist. Venezuela is sitting on the number two largest natural gas reserves, and they burn their clothes in the winter to stay warm. And if you're talking about a choice in this election, you want someone that's going to deliver an adequate quality of life with the highest environmental standards. Do you think other countries have the environmental standards that the United States does? No. So right now, we told Chevron to turn on the taps in Venezuela so that they can pay their loans back to Putin? Does that make any sense? What we need is common sense approaches and bipartisanship. And that's what I look forward to in US Congress. We need to make sure that we have permitting open. And it's very disingenuous when we have this administration, administration saying, well, the profits are being made, and we gave them the go-ahead to drill. We can't get a permit to dispose of brackish water. We can't get a permit for rights of way. It takes one year. So let's not lie to the American people. I think a national policy, you might look at New Mexico as an example, because New Mexico is blessed with abundant natural resources. Well, we all have oil and gas that's important for our budget and for jobs. We're also blessed with wind and solar and geothermal and the capacity to actually have biofuels that could do amazing things. So when we talk about national policy, we need to invest in the array of energy technologies that we have available to us, both in New Mexico and across this beautiful nation of ours. So the uh, Inflation Reduction Act was the single largest investment in clean energy. It is gonna be really great for New Mexico because it is gonna also bring resources so that we can create more uh, wind farms and solar farms, and that we can create the new technologies that we don't even know what they are yet, right? We need to invest in our, in our CHIPS and Science Act that we also passed, is gonna invest in helping us find those new technologies. You know, I uh, sat on a, a board with the, uh, one of the top people at New Mexico Tech, and they described to me how New Mexico could actually have biofuels that would fuel the entire nation, replace the entire nation's supply of diesel. That's an example of innovation in a way that we need it. And so what I am supporting, I voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, I have voted for increasing energy development because the, all of those, the other great thing is all of these energies that I've described, they are cheaper and better than anything that came before. So we are saving money when we are investing in renewable energy, and that's, that's like a win-win, isn't it? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And our next question will begin with candidate Ledger Fernandez, and this is a change of pace for you two. This question asks, what would it take to get representatives of the two major parties Republican and Democrat, to work more effectively together in Congress? Oh, I like this question. Let me tell you, I am doing that right now. When I talked about, uh, I work on such a bipartisan uh, manner in Congress. Uh, I have introduced numerous bills. About 11 of my bills are bipartisan. My Hermit's Peak bill was bipartisan. We uh, looked at uh, the, we looked at my voting record because we were wondering about that, and about 95% of my votes are bipartisan. And I think that there is a problem that that gets overlooked. People don't understand how much work we do together. I am also chair of the Subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples. It's kind of really neat because fresh, freshmen don't usually get to chair a committee, but because of my long history representing Native Americans, I get to chair the Subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples. That is one of the most bipartisan committees in Congress, and why? Because we look at how do we solve this problem? How do we get to the solutions? I asked, uh, I took 10 bills to the floor of the House uh, just from my committee one day, and I tell you, half of those bills, I was standing up promoting bills that were, uh, that Republicans had sponsored. 
and that they, I had co-sponsored most of those bills with them, but I was promoting their bills on the floor of the House. I did that the beginning of November uh, last year, and I did it at the end of November the following year. Once again, bipartisan bills. What you do is you look to your colleagues and you find out where do we have agreement on solutions. And you have those conversations. And I have done that a whole bunch these last 22 months, and I've truly enjoyed it, I can tell you that. All right, candidate Martinez Johnson. <laughs> I think that we can listen to the people when we have campaign finance reform. It is very difficult for individuals that receive so much money from other parts of the country to really listen to their counterpart. And I think that people need to remember when they were little girls, little boys, growing up in poverty, and what that looked like. And as women, the trials and tribulations that were here, the League of Women Voters, specifically I'm talking about women since this is the forum for the women. And we need to remember what that path looked like. And instead of listening to other people and others tell us what to do, I think we need to remember the priority of what we're doing here. Are we here to work together and to support women? And once you lose sight of why you ran, that's when we get into trouble, right? When we have to listen to special interests, when we have to listen to others tell us how to think, what to do, that's when the real problems start. And that's when this great American experiment that you guys came to see, that's when it is dissolved. It is dissolved when money and power reign supreme and the New Mexican vote is there no longer. If you have the most money, you can communicate to anybody here anything that you want. A lie becomes true. How does that happen? A dollar bill. So I would look forward to supporting campaign finance reform, maybe only even raising money in your own district. That's a novel idea. You know, Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic uh, institution can't even pass a bill that says we're not going to have insider trading. in both ears. Um, okay. So the next question, which will be for candidate Martinez Johnson. Okay. Thank you. And this question is, what can a person in the House of Representatives representing New Mexico do to support mental health in New Mexico? Well, we need more centers. We need funding for more centers. We need the veterans to be fully funded. Whenever I heard that some of the um, health centers and the clinics were gonna be um, taken out, I thought to myself, wow, if I was in US Congress, that would have never even come to the table because we need to value our veterans and a lot of them have issues from war-related trauma. So I would say funding for veterans. We need to take a hard look at funding them and making sure that we have funds available, but also those root causes that we see in our schools. You know, when you're talking about gun control, when you're talking about these various serious issues where we have children that are going through the cracks, they need to have resources for mental health. And I think this would decrease a lot of the violence that we see. So I would do everything that I can in US Congress to make sure that our children and the next generation are going to have a chance. And it starts from early childhood. If the parents are not going to be able to be there to provide a good environment, we have to step up to the plate. Children have to be funded. They have to be able to eat. You know, we need to fund all the children so that they can eat, fund, make sure that they have uh, counselors for them. And I really like, and I know this is a stretch from federal funding, but Extracurricular activities for kids really saves them 
when they can't go home because they're in maybe an abusive home. And I think, I think it all starts with children. So as a mother of four, I would really look to make sure that we are funding the well-being of children. Thank you. Thank you. As I noted earlier, this kind of question goes, is not theoretical for me. It is something that my family has lived because we lost those two brothers uh, to undiagnosed mental health conditions as well as addiction. And so I know what New Mexicans go through um, when we are faced with the issues regarding behavioral health. And the reality is we do not have behavioral health services available across this district. I represent a rural district. Uh, and in some parts of my district, there are simply no behavioral health specialists. So what am I doing about that? And this is what I have done about it. That's the good thing is that we have done things about it. In the American Rescue Plan, we put money in specifically to increase the availability of behavioral health services in the schools. In the Safer Communities Act, which I also voted for, we put money in to assist in schools so that we could have school counselors, but more than school counselors. We need to have behavioral health professionals in the schools, and we voted for that. And that money, I'm going to make sure, as I I said earlier that we bring that money down. With regards to veterans, what we have done over the last 22 months is increase the appropriations for veterans many fold. And indeed, we, I am um, a co-sponsor of a key bill that focuses on increasing those funds as well as then making sure that we provide them to the veterans for the range of issues they, they face. Also, law enforcement faces behavioral health issues. We need to make sure one of the four bills I voted for uh, a month ago includes um, health, behavioral health, mental health specialists, not just to go out on a call, but also to assist the law enforcement providers of, uh, in there. I am funding those kinds of behavioral health clinics in MOTA and in different parts of my district. They are getting help from my office, so I am actually doing what is needed to address the mental health crisis. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't want to shout at you for going this. <laughs> but anyway, we have to look at that red stop. Um, the, the next, did you do that? OK, good job. Good job. Um, crime is a major issue for voters this year. That's obvious. And the question is, as a United States representative, what measures do you support at the federal level to reduce the amount of crime? Thank you for that question. Um, one of the key jobs of government is to make sure we feel secure and protected in our communities and in our homes and in our schools and our businesses. Uh, we also, so what we need to do is make sure we bring that security and that safety by addressing two things. One, providing law enforcement with the resources they need and addressing the root causes of crime. So I am pleased that we have increased the funding that goes, the federal funding that goes to law enforcement significantly in the last two appropriations. So the federal money that comes down to the states. but. You know, this summer I voted for four bills that are going to really help the issue here in New Mexico. One of the bills, Invest to Protect, would increase the funding to small police departments, which is basically everybody in my district. So police departments under than 100, less than 125. And what that's going to do is provide funding so that they can retain, recruit, and keep uh, law enforcement. Um, we also. I am, you know, the Curry County Sheriff said, can you help me get those virtual glasses so that my officers are trained before they go into a dangerous situation? That is also key. We, I have done things to make sure that we are providing federal resources so we can identify trafficked individuals. I've held training so that we can help with the missing, murdered indigenous women issues. And I also say it at the beginning, so I want to get there, that is that we need to also make sure we address the root causes of crime. We need to address mental health issues. We need to create jobs, and we need to create a safe community for everybody to thrive. So it really is both of those, and on both of those, I am working, and we are actually delivering more money to law enforcement, more money to our officers, and more money to address the root causes of crime. Thank you. 
Thank you. New Mexico is the number two violent crime state in the United States. So what has worked? What has worked? It's not working. If you have human trafficking and you have border cartels that are trafficking women and children and men, and you are not getting serious about the very criminal organizations that are on our border that come right through this corridor, right down this interstate, right through Santa Fe. If you are not serious about that, then you are completely missing the point. You are not addressing root causes when you have no safety in the border area. The cartels are absolutely running the show. And we need to take this seriously and stop ignoring it and stop saying that the border is secure when we in fact know it is not. We in fact know, as we see here through Santa Fe, we see individuals on drugs and we know that there's a chemical dependence. And at some times, for some people, there can be a criminal element, whether the individual needs to get more drugs. And uh, I live right down the street right here. And if you leave your car door open at night, you definitely will not have anything left. And many of you live in this community right here, and you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Drug in New Mexico permeate throughout the entire United States. And we need to get serious about that, and we're not. We're not serious about it. If you can't even address the issue and say, you know what, cartels running the show is not gonna work, and we need to work together to solve a problem, then you're not being serious. We need action and not a lot of talk. We need people to work together and put party partisan politics aside and say, how are we gonna prevent drugs from infiltrating our community? People are let out there in Roswell with the Beltran case. Uh, judges let them out and they murdered a woman. Catch and release, it needs to end. Thank you. And our next question will start with candidate Martinez Johnson and it is related, in a way, to the previous question. And that question is, what immigration policies do you think would be effective and should be enacted at the federal level? At the federal level, we need to have more people there. You know, like my counterpart has voted for 87,000 IRS agents, I think we need 87,000 border agents. That way they can process people that want to come and experience the American dream. Hardworking families, like the family that I came from, that want to display what America means. And it does not mean what we're doing right now, which is complete ignoring, and it's not compassionate. Is it compassionate to rear your children while they're doing something wrong and to turn the other way and say, oh, they'll figure it out? No, you have to Tough love, it has to be tough love. We have to have technological measures at that border, advanced screening, funding, people. Open up the processing centers, process work visas. Why is that so difficult in 2022 to process all of the individuals living in Santa Fe as second class citizens? And when they get in a car accident, they bow their head because they know that somebody might yell at them and it's, it's sad, it's an absolute travesty of this American experiment. And I am embarrassed that Republicans and Democrats can't come to the table and come up with real solutions. I'm very passionate about this and this is something that I would look to lead, a bipartisan solution for the US border to make it safe for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And it is absolutely true that our immigration system is broken and it needs fixing. And if we fixed it, the United States would actually realize a $1.3 trillion benefit if we fixed our immigration system, which is why I have been a champion and have been part of bipartisan bills to fix the immigration system. So what have some of those bills been? One of them is the Dreamer Bill, our DACA. On a bipartisan basis, we passed that out of the House. It died in the Senate because we couldn't get 10 Republican senators because they decided to focus on the border and to talk only about the border as an issue, as a political bludgeon, and it killed our dreamers' dreams. We also passed on a 
hugely bipartisan basis out of the House, the Farm Worker Modernization Act, because we need to make sure that our farm workers, we do not have another, enough help in our fields. And we rely on immigrant labor to get that done. And the Farm Worker Modernization Act was a compromise between the United Farm Workers, the unions, the people doing that work, and the agribusiness. Got it out of the house. But because they decided to make the border and only talk about the border, they would not pass something everybody knows is needed. We must honor and respect those who pick the food we eat. We also passed um, uh, bills to deal with other issues. And you know, when it comes back to it, it should be something that we recognize and can get across. We, need the, we have the comprehensive immigration reform actually does all of the things I just talked about and, and sends more money to the border and sends more money to where those drugs are coming in, which is at the points of entry. And we have started increasing the funding for the points of entry. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next question is a topic that has certainly raised lots of emotion and lots of deep thinking in our nation. And this will begin with you, Representative Ledger Fernandez. What is your position in terms of your role in the United States House of Representatives on the legalization of abortion? I, like most New Mexicans, trust women to make personal decisions about their health care including their reproductive health care and abortion themselves. I trust women to make that decision in conversation with their doctors, with their faith, and with their familia without governmental interference. Unfortunately, my opponent has supported a total ban on abortion and refused to answer the question about abortion in the League of Women Voters Guide. Not me. I have taken positions on it, and my positions have always been consistent. I am a co-sponsor, and I voted to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. I also voted to pass the bill that would allow women to travel from one state to another without being criminalized just to get health care. I had some difficult pregnancies myself. Um, I had to make very difficult decisions about my health care that involved my life, uh, I was able to make those decisions myself without any interference from strangers, from government. So once again, I trust women to make those very personal decisions themselves without governmental interference in consultation with their own doctors, their own family, and their own faith. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Martinez Johnson. Thank you. I, we both have had twins, right? And twins are born pretty much prematurely. My children were born at 32 weeks, and I never knew that children could live that early. And I fought for their lives every day in the NICU, and when they came into this world at 32 weeks, they were looking for mother, they were crying. And this is a very personal decision. And I can only imagine the fear that I felt is similar to the fear that many other women and fathers felt. This is a very personal question, but I think the question needs to be asked. What do the constituents want? And right now, we're not even doing what the constituents want. We're saying no exceptions to the point of birth. That's 39 weeks and you're talking about no exceptions, I am here to present a common ground. 15 weeks is common ground. Up to 39 weeks is extreme. Democrats and Republicans say that it's extreme to go to all the way to the 39 weeks, yet that's what special interests pay for in New Mexico. Special interests in New Mexico fund my candidate and they pay for a taxpayer-funded abortion clinic in the highest Hispanic population in New Mexico. 
So my answer is very simple. 15 weeks? If it is in the event of the life of the mother or the baby, they're going to die at 17, 18, 19 or weeks, then yes, they do need to have proper care. Let's use common sense and let's not try to demonize anyone. We all have different life experiences and it's time to stop going to the extremes and working together. Thank you. And the next question is for candidate Ledger Fernandez. Yes, or Martinez Johnson. Martinez Johnson. This is a different topic. Do you support a single payer health care system and on the federal level? And if yes, why? And if no, why? A single payer health care system. Well, let's talk about getting health care in New Mexico first off. It doesn't matter if you're single payer, if you are private payer. Can you get a doctor's appointment right now? Can you call your doctor right now and get a doctor's appointment? So before we even go to coverage, let's just get walk in the door and get some care. In New Mexico, trial lawyers and lawyers like my counterpart have made it to where the liability is so high in New Mexico that doctors don't even want to come here. And you can ask your friends, and some of you in this room may even be doctors, and you know what I'm saying is true. When I called the doctor here and I asked to take my daughter in with 103 fever, they said, we're taking appointments into December. So I think we need to actually talk about getting care first and removing such an extreme liability. I'm not here to, to go to the extremes. Let's work with something where people are cared for when they have a surgery and there's a mishap. Let's have them covered. But to the point where we can't get doctors in New Mexico? I mean, we have more than 80% of New Mexicans on government uh, care in regard to medical. So, you know, I'm gonna support Medicare. I'm gonna support Medicaid. I was that little girl on free lunch. My, uh, my grandfather worked and he had uh, the city care. But you know what? I want all children to have the chance that I had to become successful, to become an engineer, to be able to come out here and run for Congress. And how can they do that if they're not healthy? So, you know, what you're seeing right now in the ads that are being put out by my counterpart and their team is an absolute lie. Why would I n not cover pre-existing conditions? That's ludicrous. All of us, we, I'm sure all of us have some pre-existing condition. My twins were born with a pre-existing condition. So I'm gonna absolutely fund Medicare, Medicaid, and any pre-existing condition you have, it's gonna be covered 110%. Thank you. I think the issue of Accessibility to healthcare is one of, it's, it's sad, right, that so many in New Mexico, so many in our country do not have access to healthcare. Uh, and so right now what we are working with is the Affordable Care Act. And what we are trying to do is improve the ability of the Affordable Care Act to provide health services to uh, the people who rely on it, that the Affordable Care Act increased by millions and millions of people, those who didn't have any kind of insurance and we're trying to make it better. We have reduced the cost of health care. Uh, we did that first with the American Rescue Plan and then we has also did that with the Inflation Reduction Act. We also are bringing down the cost of prescription drugs in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we are capping what seniors would pay for prescription drugs. So we are doing a lot to improve the health system we have. And the reality is that my opponent is supported and funded by those who would do away with the Affordable Care Act. If we get rid of the Affordable Care Act and she's receiving funds, they're paying for her TV ads attacking me, we get rid of the protections for pre-existing conditions. They have written it down, we are not making this up. It is written down, it is what they have said they will do if they get control of Congress. And so I think it's important to be honest with people about who you are being supported by and who you will join if you uh, are elected to Congress. Dime con quien eres y te digo quien eres. Tell me with whom you won and I will tell you who you are. We must protect 
uh, the Affordable Care Act, we must protect the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that limit uh, prescription drug prices. I am going to fight and, and stand up against the big pharma. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> this brings us on a t to a topic that is timely. We're sitting here in a candidate forum and it is an election question. This question asks, where do you stand on the issue of election security? What, if anything, should we do to protect voting rights and ensure here in New Mexico that votes are protected and accurately counted? Yes. Election integrity is a buzzword that is being used to undermine our democracy. I have spent my career fighting to make sure that every voter has equal access to the ballot box and that all votes have the same weight. So I was the voting rights expert. Before I was elected to Congress, I fought to make sure that we had early voting in our rural areas, that we had early voting access in our Native American areas. And so as a result of my championing of voting rights issues, I actually sit on the House Subcommittee on Elections. And we have had hearing after hearing after hearing uh, where we are examining the ways in which Republican legislators, not in New Mexico, but across the country, are aiming to restrict the ability of Latino communities, black communities, Native American communities to be able to vote with the same ease as any other communities. Uh, I am a proud co-sponsor of the John Lewis uh, uh, Voting Rights Act as well as the Freedom to Vote Act. And in fact, I got provisions in the Freedom to Vote Act that come out of our experience here in New Mexico. Nobody should have to wait eight hours in line to vote, right? And they, people have to do that because they won't put polling places in poor communities. They won't put polling places in black communities, Latino communities. That's one of my provisions to say that nobody should have to wait for more than 30 minutes. Uh, our elections have had the highest degree of integrity. Uh, those who attack our elections are joining forces with the Russians and the Chinese who want to undermine our democracy. We have held hearings across the nation on this, including here in New Mexico. We must do everything we can to protect our democracy. Our democracy is challenged, is fragile, is beautiful, and it's on the ballot this November. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. I would never be against my own ability to vote. If anybody in here hasn't noticed, I'm brown, and I'm Hispanic. I have Native American ancestry. I'm very proud of that. So I would never support anything that would prevent me from voting, prevent my family from voting, and I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. My, some of my family's Democrat. And you know what? We're gonna do every single thing that we can to get these communities to vote. We are in Navajo Nation, we are in uh, the Pueblos, we are in Rawls, we're all over the state. And you can look on my Twitter, Alexis Johnson NM, and see that we've been making such an effort to get young people to vote, old people of all races and colors. And quite frankly, to say that the word integrity is a buzzword is offensive. You have to have integrity. There's nothing wrong with having integrity. When you say integrity, yeah, every single person in here should want to know that the ballot's counted, checked, and it's transparent, it's bipartisan, and whatever the results may be, guess what? We're going to accept that. If it goes through a court and that's the result, that's the way the United States runs. It goes through courts, and guess what? We accept that. So I'm going to be a person that's going to accept election results. But do we want it to be checked? Of course. We want a bipartisan group making sure that all the votes are there. Do we want to make sure that everybody can have the ability to vote and that we educate voters? I'm really about educating voters and giving them the power, letting them know where the polling places are, if they need assistance, and if there's anybody out there that needs help, Go ahead and contact my campaign, and we can set you up with, um, uh, you know, getting to the polls or getting assistance, getting help. People like the League of Women Voters, you can reach out to them, and they can help you get to the polls. So I would always be supporting integrity, government accountability, and quite frankly, there's nothing wrong with that. 
Thank you. And for our last question, before we have final closing remarks, this is an education question. And this person would like to know what you think is the responsibility of the federal government to address the country's educational system on the federal level. Yes. <laughs> well, I'd like to see funding for our children, like I mentioned before. So whatever we can do to provide funding in that matter, and this is an innovative idea. Let's look at, for instance, Los Alamos, very affluent community, very high in regard to masters and PhDs. And then we see Española, right? And we see that there's a extreme poverty. What can we do in these areas to make sure that federal funds can go into the community? Maybe we could have these professors go on uh, these sab a sabbatical, these scientists, these engineers, go to Española, go to Roswell, go to Clovis, and spend time teaching our children STEM education. I'd really like to see New Mexico pursuing heavy STEM education. I think we could uh, make sure that our children are equipped. But first off, I mean, Let's look at reality here. We are 51st in the nation in education. That's not propaganda. That's not me coming up with lies. That's a fact. Let's look at facts, OK? And I encourage all of you to do your research on us and find the actual facts, right? Um, why are we 51st in education when we receive about, oh, I'd say a billion dollars from the energy industry per year? So there's something wrong there. Money is obviously not the answer. There needs to be expertise. And that, quite frankly, that is the main difference here, is that I'm providing actual common sense solutions, expertise with a great care for children, and making sure that a little girl like myself, like Teresa, that grew up in Las Vegas and grew up in Roswell, can actually achieve what her and I have achieved. I'm here to support women, and I have no personal animus. I am here to support all women and be proud that you have two Hispanic women here against all odds representing this community. And I think once we get back to what we're doing here, that's when this state will really shine. Thank you. Thank you. You know, as the little girl who went to Hard Start, that's where I fell in love with learning. And I want every young child to have that same opportunity to fall in love with learning. I just uh, finished speaking with uh, people who are part of the celebration of Head Start's uh, uh, anniversary uh, that's coming up. And I think that we need to invest in the, our youngest children. We do know that uh, an investment in our youngest in education has one of the best uh, results, which is why I supported and advocated for investing uh, in both providing funding for education at the earlier stages, but also making sure that we invested in the teachers and those who were, who were going to care and educate our youngest children. They need to receive the education, the support, and the pay that they deserve. And that happens all the way up and down, right? So from our young, those who teach our youngest through those who teach, uh, those who get a PhD. I am in support of Constitutional Amendment 1 because uh, I want to vote yes for kids because we do need to, at the state level, invest it. And I want to bring federal resources to match that state investment. I've also made sure we've increased funding. New Mexico got about a billion dollars more for its education because I raised the issue of Title I schools in my first hearing. I sit on the Education and Labor Committee hearing. I am sure it's my mom and dad up in heaven saying, honey, you're going to sit on the Education Committee because both my teachers were educators and loved their jobs. We're also making sure that we put more money into apprenticeships because some people might not want to go and become a scientist at Los Alamos. But wow, pipe fitting, welders, those are great jobs and we want to be able to support education at all levels. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you both. We have now arrived at the end of our questioning session, and we now will have closing remarks, one closing remark from each candidate, and this time we will start a closing remark section with candidate Ledger Fernandez. That's what it says on my list. 
Okay, thank okay. you. Did you start? Didn't I start? You did. Start. Uh, what, what? It's anyway. okay. It's, it's all right. We'll figure it out. I think my script says Ledger Fernandez. I'm looking to my boss over here. I started. All right. So, okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out today and spending time here. I really appreciate it. And I really look forward to being your next Congresswoman. As you can see, there is a big difference between us. And that is my priorities are making sure that you have more money in your pocket. I will absolutely be supporting anything that's bringing down that fuel cost. It's going to be hitting up $4 an hour, I mean $4 a gallon. And in addition to that, you're going to be paying more for heating costs and inflation, I mean the cost of groceries. I'm going to be a candidate that's going to work on supply chain issues. I'm going to be work on, working on energy production so that we can have a high quality of living. I'm going to be working on funding crime so we don't have to worry in Santa Fe that we have to look over our back, that someone's going to attack us, that our car is going to be broken into, that our house is. You know, it doesn't matter where you live or how much money you have. We have to be safe in our finances. We have to be safe in our own environment. Or how can we prosper? How can we give to others the best of us when we are not even at that level right here? And as you're seeing with this administration, it's a continuation on a downward slope. And all you have to do is look at the statistics. So I'm going to be someone that's going to be common sense. I'm going to be making sure to be bringing problem-solving solutions to New Mexico. That's been my expertise, creating jobs, making sure the welfare of children is taken care of. In my spare time, I'm a coach for kids. You know, I have a, I'm really invested in the community, and it's not all about people telling you what to do, special interests telling you how to vote. You know, whoever, you know, anybody says is backing me or whatnot, I answer to New Mexicans. And really, when we get back to answering to the people and their voice, whether it's women's issues, whether it's energy, whether it's the environment, and we work together, that's when we'll win. Please check out my website, electalexis.com. Thank you for your time. Thank you, candidate Martinez Johnson. I'm Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, a daughter of rural New Mexico, the mother of three beautiful children, a breast cancer survivor, a sister who lost two beautiful brothers to addiction. My work is inspired by the pain New Mexicans face. And I am delivering in Congress because I am bringing experience, 30 years worth of experience, delivering for my communities, starting small businesses, building health clinics, building schools, making sure that we have the infrastructure. And I am now doing that in Congress bigger and better. I am making sure that we are bringing hundreds of millions to our state so that we can build infrastructure, broadband, clean water. We are, build, we are building water projects from the Gallup Navajo pipeline because nobody should go without water in their homes to the Eastern, the Eastern Water Project because there are too many straws stuck in the aquifer and we need to help before the aquifer dries out. And we are also tackling inflation, because it's not right that New Mexicans are taking food out of their carts when the big greedy corporations are simply putting more profit into their pockets. We know that inflation is caused by the Putin's war, by greedy corporations, and by the supply chain problems. We are addressing each of those. We are already doing that because we know the pain. I feel the pain of that inflation. So we have passed the CHIPS Act to address supply chain issues. We have uh, passed price gouging legislation. And I am going to continue delivering because I really rely on that sum. In Jeremiah 29:11, God's plan is for us to prosper, have future and hope, and that's what my job in Congress is to do, is to help create that prosperity, that hope, and that future for New Mexico we all love. I will continue listening and delivering if you vote for me on November 8th. Muchisimas gracias. Teresa Ledger Fernandez for Congress. Thank you, candidate Ledger Fernandez. Um, and I would like to say to all of you who are sitting in this room and to all of you who are Zooming into this room, you have had a privileged evening. We live in a time of toxic partisanship. And you have before you two 
excellent women, both born and bred here in New Mexico, both able to state their differences, state them clearly and with conviction and without animosity. Treasure that. We don't see it every day in our society. So for that, candidate Martinez Johnson, candidate Ledger Fernandez, you are spectacular. And I thank you very, very much. But we have more to say. Um, that concludes the evening. And what I would like to do now, and I hope you will all do this, do it if you're on Zoom too, put your hands together for these two amazing women.